welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, past, present, and sometimes even the future. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and got that something, how the Beatles, I want to hold your hand, changed everything, and co-author with Adrian Sinclair of The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, due out on November 8th. I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know as the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and a co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. And he has his own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, um, just packed with Beatles-related interviews and things. So, Ken, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And I'm very excited about this show because we're actually taking an idea from one of our listeners or viewers so we've been telling people we'll take your ideas and this will be proof of that (laughs) how well it'll go is another story (laughs) right (laughs) okay and darren devivo a dj at wfuvfm 90.7 in the new york area since 1984 that's Darren's been there since 1984. It's been there longer. Um, If you're not in New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. And Darren has some other ways to get to him, which he'll tell you at the end. Darren, how's it going? It's it's going good. You push it, it goes. And we'll see you again here on Things We Said Today. What's up, Ken? (laughs) Hello, Alan. Hello, everyone. Hey, Darren. Okay, and as Ken said, uh, today we have a unusual show, I think, Um, but first we'll hear the news, Ken. Okay, well, the biggest news event, which I'm sure everybody's heard by now, is that after several delays for the DVD Blu-ray release, the Beatles documentary for Get Back now has an official release date, and that happens to be July 12th. According to Variety, Get Back had originally been scheduled to come out February 8th after an initial announcement January 5th. But Beatle fans who had placed their orders noticed them getting canceled as the winter release date approached. It was said the reason for the cancellation was an imperfection in the 7.1 audio mix, causing the discs to need to be remanufactured. A few copies, however, did slip out at retail despite the pre-release recall and became high-end bid items on the resale market. Unfortunately though, despite high hopes from Beatle fans, the DVD Blu-ray will not have any extra footage than what we were showing on Disney Plus. It will, however, include a fold-out package that will include four commemorative cards with photos of the individual Beatles. And both editions include several audio options with the Blu-ray offering Dolby Atmos, 7.1 PCM, 2.0 PCM, and 2.0 descriptive audio. And the DVD has 5.1 and 2.0 Dolby Digital, along with 2.0 descriptive audio. So fingers crossed here, you know, we've been disappointed before. I'm sure that some of us will still be cynical on hearing this release date, but the new date that we're given now is July 12th. Any comments, guys? No, but I want to hear you interpret all of the technical stuff that you just mentioned. It ain't going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> you I know, guess I the descriptive wondering. audio is is they're going to describe what is happening, and you know what I want to know is how technical it's going to be. It's like is John is playing a C sharp minor chord with an added seventh. Uh, he's using the third position. Uh, what is he doing? It's going to be like watching golf on television. Yeah. Yeah. Ringo Starr has just farted everyone. And he has notified George, uh, everybody in the studio. He did. It's he did. Ken looks like he did. And the- I know, I know. They highlighted <laughs> that in Ringo's interviews on television. Like that was such an important moment of the documentary. But anyway. It's definitely a beetle first. <laughs> a beetle gas. Okay. There you go. Well, speaking of Ringo, it looks like he has received an honorary doctorate from the Berkeley College of Music for their class of 22. Ringo went online to say, trust me, I'm a doctor. 
of music, of course. Congratulations to the class of 2022 Berkeley College of Music who graduated today. I send you all peace and love and my thanks for this honorary doctorate degree. You might recall that Paul McCartney himself also got an honorary doctorate of music. That was at Yale University. Can't believe how far back we're going. That was in 2008. I feel like that happened yesterday. And so a reminder that- All the surviving it? Beatles are now doctors. That's true. And knights. To address them that way. <laughs> well, you got a choice then. <laughs> Doctor or sir. Uh, Ringo's new tour with the All-Stars starts Friday, May 27th. That's less than two weeks away now. The first of two dates at the Casino Orama in Ontario. Well, without an official word, Paul McCartney gave us a teaser in the program book that accompanies his new Got Back tour. In it, he says to check out his website, paulmccartney.com, for information on new archival releases from his catalog. So the rumor mill continues with fans speculating that it will be London Town and Back to the Egg, the two Last Wings albums. And Paul has been selling coasters on his tour and on his website as well, a set of four for $40 with one for London Town, one for Back to the Egg, uh, one for Venus and Mars, and one that's a world map. So with the coasters as well, this will fuel the fire for a London Town Back to the Egg package, much like the recent Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway one. All right, we mentioned Get Back before. The documentary series has just gotten a nomination for a 2022 MTV Movie and TV Award. It received the nod for Best Music Documentary Honor. The award will be given out as part of the MTV Movie and TV Awards Unscripted Ceremony, a reality-focused spinoff of the original show. And this will air live from Los Angeles on June the 5th. And another award to uh, record here, actually two. The new video that was made for George Harrison's Isn't It a Pity, Take 27, from the archival box set for All Things Must Pass, just won two Clio Awards. Danny Harrison sent out congratulations to the team called Assembly, that's David Zonshan and Kelly Mahan for their wins. The video received bronze awards in the categories four, one of them was called Music Videos, and the other, Animation. Danny says, I sobbed me eyes out the first time I saw this. Mega nice one. Some more news about the Beatles kids here. According to Chimeramusic.com, the two albums from the Claypool Lennon Delirium featuring Sean Lennon will be coming out on repressed colored vinyl in stores this Friday, May the 20th. Those are for the album South of Reality, what they call the Amethyst Edition, and Monolith of Phobos for the Phobos and Demos uh, Moon Editions. And concerning another Lennon, that's Julian. We already know that his new single, Every Little Moment, has been released digitally, as has the B-side Freedom. And he has a new album coming out called Jude. And we don't have the uh, official release date for that as of yet, but he has done two interviews that I know of to promote his new music. One is with Elton John, the other with Jordan Runtag, and they're both on Apple Podcasts, you should check out. Abbey Road on the River, the annual festival that features primarily Beatles tribute bands from around the world with some special guest speakers, will be running May 26th through the 30th in Jeffersonville, Indiana. Guest performers include Tommy James, The Circle, The Fab Four, and they will also have something called The Love Concert 2.0. To find out more, you can visit their website, which is a-R-O-T-R dot com. Some key members of the Beatles family going out on the road include Billy J. Kramer. So far, one date, which will be at the Cutting Room in New York City on June 6th. Peter Asher, once again, teaming up with Jeremy Clyde of Chad and Jeremy, performing at the Kate in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. And that's on June the 20th. And finally, today we send out happy birthday wishes to Olivia Harrison, who turns 74. All right, happy birthday, Olivia. Yeah, happy birthday. I, I have a news item. You do? I have an item of news. Yeah, you were just talking about um, um, 
those out on the road and 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 those from the Beatle family. Mm -hmm. um, Ringo's current tour, his current all star band. Of course, this tour was supposed to happen a couple of years ago, and at the time when the tour uh, was first announced, Greg Raleigh was returning on keyboards and vocals, right? But uh, the postponements through the pandemic. Fast forward, here we are, 2022. Greg Raleigh's not part of the All Star Band, uh, which we all know. And this could very well be the reason why. He's uh, part of a new group called New Soul. That's S O L, New Soul. And according to their website, which is newsoulband.com, uh, this is a group that was started by. Yayo Sanchez and Sean Raleigh, his son, I think. Don't hold me to that because it makes no mention of, you know, the relation. Maybe it's a nephew or whatever the case might be. But um, these two guys met in Austin, Texas, and a band came together and they invited Greg Raleigh to uh, come on board. So uh, they are either finished or about to finish recording their debut album uh they recorded in el paso texas i believe that's where this is i don't think i missed anything and there is a new single out there uh that has been released digitally which i believe was called flower song so um i think that's uh, i think that's what i'd mentioned uh so that's the whereabouts of greg raleigh Maybe he'll be back with the All-Star Band in the future, but for now, former All-Star Band member, and his new group is New Soul. Okay. okay. Great musician. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, so on to the show. Um, the main part of the show. Um, this is an idea that um, was sent in by a listener or viewer named Mike Demakos, who's someone that I met at, um, at the White Album Symposium at Monmouth University in 2018. Um, and we had, uh, you know, some interesting chats there and uh, sort of kept in touch. And he periodically sends an idea, um, which mostly I guess we haven't used. Um, but this one was so unusual. It, I, I sort of ran it past Darren and Ken and um, and they agreed to give it a shot and we'll see how the, how it goes. It's it's kind of a game in a way. Um, what he proposes is that for every Beatles album, we choose two tracks, one track that could have gone on the previous album and one track that could have gone on the next album. And I guess the criteria for that will be up to us individually. Um, obviously for Please Please Me, we can only choose one track that could have been on with the Beatles. Although um, I suppose some of those tracks could have gone on the Tony Sheridan recordings um, if we thought about it. But, um, and obviously Abbey Road, sort of the same thing. There's, there's no next album so we choose a track that could have gone on let it be and uh i thought what we would do is go around album by album and do our picks for the uh the tracks i think now the the idea is that, you know what struck me as interesting about it um and not just a sort of parlor game is that you know we always think of the beatles as changing significantly from album to album and they did you know each one of those albums has a completely different character um and yet you know there's also a a gradual evolution going on and by looking at this um you know two track exercise you can kind of see what the connections are from one album to the next to the next to the next um we're using the british albums and in a certain way, having all three of us grown up, I guess, with the American albums, I mean, that, that's a little bit of a cheat because Capital did a lot of what he's talking about. Um, so uh, I know that I, I tried in most cases to avoid taking the easy Capital way, but, uh, you know, you never know. Sometimes it happens. Uh, so why don't we start with Please Please Me. Ken, what do you think on there could go on with the Beatles? 
Well, before I get to that, <laughs> I want to say a few things. First of all, this is a great idea, but it's not without its flaws. I mean, part of the part of the problem that I have with this is that I wish that I can go into the entire catalog blind and not know the history of some of these songs and when they were started. Um, for example, please, please me, we know that the Beatles in one day recorded 10 of the 14 songs from Please Please Me. One of the songs that they attempted, but they weren't happy with, was Hold Me Tight, which they eventually put on with the Beatles. So in my mind, in my brain, I'm still thinking Please Please Me could have had Hold Me Tight anyway, just because I know that. It's the same thing with um, the Help album. The Beatles worked on Wait. They worked on What Goes On and they both ended up on rubber soul so that can influence your decision here mm -hmm. um and like alan was just saying if you were brought up on the american albums especially rubber soul mm -hmm. and you've got i've just seen the face burned into your brain as the opening track on rubber yep. soul and we know that it came from help well then you're obviously going to say well i've just seen a face could have been on rubber soul so um you know these have a way of influencing your choices. And um, in some cases, it's been, it was very tough, you know, <laughs> what we hear in our heads, what could work and why. But likewise, if you're talking about the American albums and you've got Meet the Beatles and Meet the Beatles had a lot of With the Beatles on it, but it started with I Want to Hold Your Hand and I Saw Her Standing There, which was on Please Please Me, and then This Boy, you might think I Saw Her Standing There could have worked really well going on with the Beatles because you were brought up that way. So I did pick I Saw Her Standing There um, for that reason. It's a great, lively rocker, much like It Won't Be Long was a great opening rocker on with the Beatles. But I also, can I also have an honorable mention? I'm not going to do this with every, with every album. But Ask Me Why, to me, has always been a little bit more ahead of its time. I think it was a little bit more complicated a song uh, compositionally um, than some of the other songs here on Please Please Me. For that reason, because I think it was a little bit more sophisticated in what they were doing and it blows my mind that they wrote that song at such a, a young age john and paul i think that could work on with the beatles also keep in mind for for all of us who have these british albums cemented in our brains with these tracks <laughs> it's hard to to go beyond that and think that another song could have belonged on there so part of me sees that these two songs could have worked, but then I also think it worked better on Please Please Me anyway. So there you go. Why? Darren, do you want to go next? <laughs> could you repeat that? That's sort of the whole, the, my, that, that, that sort of sums up my whole, I liked the theme. And as I was doing it, as I was trying to find the songs, ultimately I looked and I went, wait a minute, I just made a roadmap of New Jersey. <laughs> um huh is a, a lot of what i found myself even looking my my own thoughts and um ideas here but um uh, so let's see and and i can't even tell you i think my criteria changed from album to album i just found it an interesting exercise but one that was a little confusing and difficult to execute through from please please me to let it be but um, we start with Please Please Me, like Ken did, obviously, first album. And the song I chose that could have been on the next album with the Beatles uh, was I Saw Her Standing There. Just, I, I don't know if it's because I heard it, um, you know, like you said, uh, on Meet the Beatles. I think of it as with kind of going hand in hand with uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand. Uh, it just seemed to just be, they just seemed to, uh, that song seems to be ahead of almost everything else that's on uh, Please Please Me. I really don't have any more detail on that. It's just to my ears, I saw her standing there is, they've already advanced. I mean, Paul McCartney's bass playing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the uh, the great bass lines 
uh, and boom, it's right there, first song on the first album. So I saw her standing there would be my pick as a track that would work and could have been debuted on the second album, which is with the Beatles, second UK album. Yeah. Okay, well... Um, in the hope that uh, we will have some disagreements later on in this, <laughs> uh, I also chose I Saw Her Standing There for pretty much the same reason Darren said. I mean, there's something about I Saw Her Standing There that strikes me as more developed than anything else on Please Please Me, although I, I get what Ken is saying about um, uh, Ask Me Why. I mean, there, there, there are some complexities in that uh, that that uh, do look a bit forward, but uh, I saw her standing there. Uh, you know, it also has kind of a, a more sort of energetic, rocky kind of sound that I think suits the other things on With the Beatles better than anything else on Please Please Me um, with the possible exception of maybe Twist and Shout, but. I was thinking that we should be thinking in terms of originals, um, which ultimately that won't be a problem, but um, that's partly why I went with that. So on to With the Beatles. Um, what are your two, Ken, going backwards and forwards? Now, wait, before oh. Ken goes, Ken, what you're doing here now is A, picking, it doesn't matter what order, two songs that not two, one song that would um, maybe have fit better on Please Please Me and vice versa, which with the Beatles track would have fit on A Hard Day's Night, correct? Yeah, not necessarily fit better, just that it could fit. Okay, okay. You know. yeah. yeah, the whole idea behind this, like Alan was saying, is that not everything was a radical departure from album to album. There right. were some mood transitions along the way. And maybe we've, we've felt that certain songs could have been on the previous or next album. Mm -hmm. uh, for With the Beatles to Please Please Me, like I said, only because I have the knowledge of this, the mere fact that I know they worked on Hold Me Tight during those sessions makes me think, you know, it could have been on Please Please Me. Again, th this, it's because we have the knowledge of this and that affects the way that I think about these songs. Um, with the Beatles, uh, what, what might have fit on a hard day's night, maybe not a second time. Um, I just feel like compositionally and lyrically and subject matter wise and, you know, getting into more complicated in relationship type songs, um, being somewhat on the negative side <laughs> uh it reminds me a little bit of i'll be back in a way so i kind of felt that it fit there mm -hmm. um darren are you going forward now with with the beatles into a hard day's night or my turn that. yeah not a second time was my choice okay so it's me now it is yeah see it's hard no, okay. Eyes are on uh, all right. So me, with the Beatles, what I did here was I found that the songs on with the Beatles that were kind of uh, jumping out at me as being songs that would have been fine on the first album it tended to be uh, the covers. Perhaps because as I was doing this, I found myself thinking, OK, early on as the songwriting uh, their own uh, individual songwriting was developing and hadn't yet kicked into gear there was more of a reliance on covers earlier in the game um and the ch choice of what songs were covered uh the arrangements the way they did their arrangements and stuff um made me tend to take the covers and push them back you know what i'm saying push them to the album that came before so with with the beatles album number two I, I singled out Devil in Her Heart uh, and then put, um, or any other cover except Till There Was You. 
which I felt till there was you could have been moved ahead to uh, A Hard Day's Night, album three. Mm -hmm. uh, but taking that one out of the mix, uh, Devil in Her Heart or Interchange, any of the other covers that were on with the Beatles and swing them up to the first album, Please Please Me. Now, as for songs on with the Beatles uh, that um, was sort of, would have sort of fit with the vibe of album three, A Hard Day's Night, I picked All My Loving, which I thought was one of the highlights compositionally of the original songs on with the Beatles. Um, and just thought the feel and the tempo of All My Loving matched a lot of the movie songs on A Hard Day's Night. So with the Beatles, All My Loving, a sign of what was to come on A Hard Day's Night, and with the Beatles, uh, Devil in Her Heart, or some of the other covers uh, reminiscent of what they did on Please Please Me. Hmm. Okay. I like what you said about Till There Was You, because that was a lot more sophisticated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. performance of the covers. And I nearly picked it uh, to go with All My Loving, but it was early in the game as I was kicking this all around and I was doing my best trying to keep it to one song, which you'll see that went out the window with the next album, but you'll see what I mean as we get through. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, <clears throat> for me, I think uh, one track on with the Beatles that could have fit comfortably on please, please me was don't bother me. Um, First of all, we don't have any George songs that early <laughs> and he should have an opportunity to be on the first album. But also there's something about, you know, the sound of the way the chords are strummed and the fact that there is some unusual percussion that they got out of the EMI instrument closet when they were recording that um, brings it closer to me to things like Anna and um, Ask Me Why and some of the other things on Please Please Me. Um, and it just felt to me musically like it might not have seemed completely out to lunch on that album. Um, and then for Hard Day's Night, um, I agree with Darren, I was go I chose All My Love In as well um, for pretty much the same reasons that Darren articulated. Um, and it also has that kind of <clears throat> bright sound that characterizes everything on a hard day's night, basically, almost everything on a hard day's night. So those are my two. Okay. Shall we, shall we move on to a hard day's night? Yeah. Yeah. Can we could change our minds here based on everybody's <laughs> suggestion? Because you make very, very good points. Uh, Hard Day's Night, uh, what would have fit on with the Beatles? I put Tell Me Why, uh, mainly because when I think of with the Beatles, I think of high energy rock and roll, and that's exactly what Tell Me Why is. Mm -hmm. It's just so bright in your face, two minutes up tempo. A lot going on, a lot going on with the drumming and the harmonies and everything like that. And I tried also, Alan, to make this all original, if I could, original compositions. So I chose Tell Me Why for that reason. A Hard Day's Night going into Beatles for Sale, in which I'm thinking the original songs were darker troubles and relationship type songs, like the first three songs on Beatles for Sale. So... I thought I'll Be Back was a smooth transition that would have fit pretty well on Beatles for Sale as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those are my choices there. Isn't I'll Be Back on Beatles 65? Am I wrong about that? I've, you know, I can't remember the American albums anymore. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that, that could also be a reason without my yeah. knowing it consciously, why, why I'd pick that. Yeah. All right. So a hard day's night for me. Um, so what I did with the, I chose one song on a hard day's night to bump back to uh, with the Beatles. And that was 
you can't do that. <laughs> um, uh, it just, again, it, you know, it's funny. You guys are talking about the U.S. albums. And for some reason, for my young ears, I had the Beatles' second album, one of the earliest, not the first, but one of the earliest albums I had. And I had it on cassette. Uh, and then we're talking like maybe when I was I don't know, seven years old or something very early on. And at that impressionable age, the way the songs on um, uh, the way the songs on the Beatles second album sounded being played on a cassette on a, on a mono tape recorder when I was younger, it just kind of those songs ended up becoming, you know, unified and you can't do that was one of the tunes that was on uh, the Beatles second album. And when I hear you can't do that, I just automatically thought, you know, it's an older song. So I took it off a hard day's night and I put it back on with the Beatles. As for stuff on a hard day's night that would have worked on the next album, Beatles for sale, Ken and I are in pretty much uh, complete agreement I, I looked at songs that tended not to be as shiny and bright, but maybe a little more introspective and down that are on a hard day's night that would have been, would have fit the vibe of Beatles for sale. But I didn't pick one. I picked a few because I just felt like there was a lot of songs here that were reflective, were introspective, were low key, kind of somber. So on a hard day's night, there was I'll Be Back, Things We Said Today, and I Love Her, If I Fell, and I put and others, because I couldn't tear them apart and say, no, If I Fell didn't belong on Beatles for Sale. They ended up all kind of having that same, in my mind, kind of like low key, maybe more serious feel to them, that I thought any really one of these songs or all of them could have been bumped ahead from A Hard Day's Night to album four, Beatles for Sale. So um, I just wrote them all down. I'll be back, things we said today, uh, and I love her, if I fell, others uh, from uh, A Hard Day's Night going to Beatles for Sale, and in the other direction was you can't do that from A Hard Day's Night back to with the Beatles. <laughs> Okay, so I agree with you on You Can't Do That. Um, I think I moved it back to With the Beatles partly because um, it, it just sort of, you know, again, had the kind of vibe that a lot of the stuff on With the Beatles has. And, um, you know, it was the B-side of Can't Buy Me Love. So definitely in the Hard Day's Night era. But I think of can't buy me love as a single and you can't do that as being very close to the american single of i want to hold your hand and i saw her standing there um i i sort of for some reason associate those two singles as being uh, kindred spirits and so i want to hold your hand while it's not on with the beatles it's from those sessions and so you can't do that sort of I felt it would be would be comfortable on the with the Beatles album for that reason. Um, and my feeling about what to move forward was um, pretty much the same as both of yours, you know, with um, with Beatles for sale, you have a, a, a notably darker album than a hard day's night and, uh, you know, a bit more down spirited in a, in a certain way. Um, and I thought of I'll be back because that fits that. And then I thought, well, I don't know, I'll be back was on Beatles 65. So maybe I should avoid that. Um, and other, you know, uh, there actually are so many of these things like, like that. And like, um, I've just seen a face going on to rubber soul that you almost begin to think that maybe Dave Dexter had something here, you know? Yeah. Um, but instead I chose, uh, one of the sort of more down-spirited songs that Darren didn't mention, I'll Cry Instead. I thought that might fit on Beatles for Sale um, thematically uh, and mood-wise. So Beatles for Sale itself. 
Ken. Hold on, Ken, before you go, I just noticed something in my notes here that I made a very light dotted line that I thought was an exit ramp onto Route 8. No, uh, the songs from A Hard Day's Night that I said, um, you know, were the tunes I would move on to Beatles for sale. I also felt that really any one of them could have been bumped ahead to help. Hmm. Um, so because to me, help was the first album that really the maturity just exploded. I mean, they're as songwriters um, and a number of the songs from A Hard Day's Night that I'm looking to move, you know, would I thought fit very neatly on help. So uh, so just that was my little addition. <clears throat> OK. Well, were those four songs again? If I fell. Um, from A Hard Day's Night to Beatles for Sale that I also thought might. Right might even work on help uh i'll be back things we said today and i love her if i fell interesting so they're all sort of introspective I, I don't, the ballads for lack of a better way describing them you know which was more indicative of where they went with beatles for sale but also help all right all great choices here <clears throat> all right beatles for sale to a hard day's night I didn't want to have any of the darker songs from Beatles for Sale because to me, A Hard Day's Night is kind of like with the Beatles in a lot of ways, very energetic, um, very bright sounding. So of the original songs, um, I thought every little thing could fit on there. Uh, it's a simple song, you know. I love the, the, the uh, guitar parts in it, the lead guitar line. Um, it just seems like with so many of the songs are on a hard day's night. It still is a positive song, two minutes long, could fit very well on there. Um, Beatles for Sale to Help, I found to be a little bit challenging there, but considering how much Help itself is such an advanced song and very deeply personal, then I would tend to think of those first three songs that are on Beatles for Sale. And I think I'm a Loser could fit pretty well. Uh, to help for that reason. I mean, you're, you're dealing with three songs in a row on Beatles for Sale that are downer songs as far as what's going on in a relationship. And, um, you know, here is a very self-reflective song in Help, and maybe I'm a Loser would be a great song to follow that. You know, nothing wrong with The Night Before. But I'm just saying in terms of, uh, you know, the songwriting and the subject matter, getting more personal, um, I think I'm a Loser could fit. But then again, any of those songs that are on Beatles for Sale that have that rockabilly sound, all the Carl Perkins stuff, uh, fits so much on Beatles for Sale that mm. sometimes I don't want to take it out of Beatles for Sale. But only because of the subject matter and the lyrics and how personal it is, I could see I'm a Loser fitting help in that in that way. None of this has been easy. <laughs> no, and, and um, I completely agree. I, after picking so many tracks from A Hard Day's Night, moving them forward into Beatles for Sale, I didn't want to pick another, I didn't want to end up picking half the album again and mm. bump that forward. So I singled out one song, I'm a Loser, from Beatles for Sale to go to help. Because I'm a loser and help, I thought thematically were very similar. Help, a cry for help. Mm -hmm. Somebody who was down and needing help might feel like they're a loser. And that's kind of how I link those two together. You know, and these, of course, are signs. These are songs and signs of things to come from John in the years ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, that type of songwriting, uh, mm -hmm. introspective, looking inward. So uh, Beatles for Sale. Album four, Into Help. Album five, I take I'm a Loser out of Beatles for Sale. I put that on Help. And let's see. So we're on Beatles for Sale in the reverse. Oh, no, I should actually. Yeah, go ahead or throw it over to uh, Alan. See, I'm confused. Even well, though you we're didn't. Actually... Did, did you tell us what from Beatles for Sale you would put on Hard Day's Night? No, that, that's what I'm going to do now. All right. Science. So I'm a loser goes from Beatles for Sale to help and in the opposite direction from Beatles for Sale backwards to a hard day's night. 
again, I went for the, the early rock cover, rock and roll music. Um, moving that back uh, to a hard day's night, but not to be predictable with going with all, you know, moving all the covers back. Um, a song that I thought was a little bit of a, maybe a, a throwback was Everybody's Trying to Be My Baby Now. So I picked that one as well as uh, a second song from Beatles for Sale that also would have fit nicely on a hard day's night. Keep in mind, a hard day's night is all originals. So you'd be, eh, you'd, could, you'd be killing. You them. want me to take three naps now after I'm done figuring this out? But so, if, you throw, if you throw on the Long Tall Sally EP as part of the Hard Day's Night thing, I mean, you know, maybe that will... <laughs> and, and a partridge in a pear tree. So, yeah. you know. Hmm. So rock and roll music and everybody's trying to be my baby come from Beatles for Sale. I'm flipping them backwards to a Hard Day's Night and I'm a loser from Beatles for Sale, moving it up uh, to the next album, which is Help, because I'm a loser and the song Help I think are cut from very similar cloths. Okay. <clears throat> Beatles for Sale was a tough one. Um, I picked the same one as Ken to go back to Hard Day's Night, Every Little Thing. Um, you know, the bright guitar sounds, the harmonies, um, just a lot of aspects of that song seem to be, you know, potentially at home with the Hard Day's Night material. Um, moving forward, however, um, I chose eight days a week and I'm not really sure that's the best one. In fact, I, I also could move eight days a week back to hard days night. <laughs> um, why did I move eight days a week to help? Um, well, although help does begin with you know, that cry for help um, that, that John has talked about in interviews and, and, and it has, you know, you've got to hide your love away. And, and there are some things that are more introspective and not cheery. Um, a, a lot of it kind of is. And I felt that eight days a week would fit in there with, you know, I need you. And, uh, you know, it's sort of a kindred spirit to, to some of the stuff on help. And also, you know, the, the stuff on side two of help is so varied that anything could fit. But as I say, uh, eight days a week is, would almost be more comfortable with hard days night. So, that's that one is a, a completely transitional song, let's say. Yeah. <laughs> so help. Ken. Okay. From help to Beatles for sale. This is the only time when I put a cover version in my list. And I thought act naturally would fit on there. Mainly because there's so much country and Western stuff on, on Beatles for sale. And that is a country song, the Buck Owen song, which the Beatles did very well. Um, and like I said at the very beginning of our show, because we were brought up on the American Rubber Soul, uh, going from help to Rubber Soul, I can easily hear I've just seen a face on the British Rubber Soul or It's Only Love, which I'm so used to hearing from the American album. I, I think both of them would fit very well. Um, yeah, again, it just goes to show how much these American albums, whether you realize it or not, even if you haven't listened to them for a long time, how much that could still influence the way that you think. <laughs> um, you know, so many times when I've done shows, podcast shows, or even on my own channel, there are people that have told me how much they love the American Rubber Soul so much. And still in my head, even after all these years of hearing the British albums, you know, when I hear It's Only Love, at the end of it, I'm thinking, girl, you know, it's like for so many years being brought up, you know, I've just seen a face into Norwegian wood. Um, yeah, it does have an effect when that's the way you've been brought up on it, as much as I love the way it came out on the British albums. But I, I can easily hear either of those two songs. And everybody will say I've just seen a face because there's a lot of uh, power that the first cut on an album has, the first thing that you hear. So you immediately can think automatically rubber soul when you hear I've just seen a face. Mm -hmm. But I picked that and I can also go with it's only love. 
I've just seen the face is really kind of lost on help too. I mean, just sort of stuck in the middle of side two, you oh. know, it's uh, that, that thing sounds made to be an album, album opener to me. Mm -hmm. So good points. And it's funny, this has nothing to do with where we're in the, in the disc discography now, but the Hey Jude compilation album, um, because I've always heard can't buy me love. I should have known better. And then a jump to the more modern sounding, more recent songs, Paperback Rider, Rain. Um, when I hear Can't Buy Me Love and I Should Have Known Better, to this day, I think first, Hey Jude, I think 1970. Wait a minute, no. Those, those were songs from 64. But, you know, that, you know, to my five-year-old ears, when I got my copy of Hey Jude, that was a seamless album. I didn't know any better. So today, Can't Buy Me Love comes on. And I think side A, side one, song one, Hey Jude, 1970. Mm. All right. So we're at what? What album are we up to? Help? Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. Help. Okay. Again, I, it made sense when I was writing them. And now it's like... So from Help, um, we took I'm a Loser right from Beatles for Sale. All right. So for help, the songs that I picked to go backwards to a uh, to Beatles for sale um, were oh uh, here I go here I go with the uh, with a cover and original. I started to say that before um, with Beatles for sale and what I would put back on a hard day's night, rock and roll music, and I was about to say everybody's trying to be my baby was an original. Um, got confused because here is that point. From Help, I want to take Dizzy Miss Lizzie and an original song, You Like Me Too Much, and put them back onto Beatles for Sale. So they're coming off of Help and going back. You Like Me Too Much seemed that they'd moved on from that type song by the time they were recording Help. Okay. And Dizzy Miss Lizzie was, again, a throwback to those earlier covers that they had been doing. Um, so I took those two and moved them back to Beatles for sale. And in the case of Dizzy Miss Lizzie, that could even have gone back further in my, in my mind. Um, mm -hmm. As for help songs moving forward, I didn't. I didn't really twist the U.S. rubber sole and U.S. this and that in this case together too much, or I may never finish this. So what I took from Help was I looked for songs on Help that fit the vibe of Rubber Soul, regardless of what happened with the U.S. album. So You've Got to Hide Your Love Away, I thought would have fit on Rubber Soul. Um, and it's only love, possibly because of the presence of the sitar. It's only love. Uh, that, and that was, of course, that's a song that was on Rubber Soul. What do you say no for? There's no sitar on It's Only Love. Uh, that twangy. Uh, okay, meow, 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 meow. okay that's, that's kind of what I meant. And, I, and It's Only Love. And that was on the U.S. Rubber Soul album, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so there was an instance where I made the connection of of uh, of a song uh, that belonged on Rubber Soul, so I chose "It's Only Love," um, and uh, "You've Got to Hide Your Love Away." I just felt was sort of again that that sort of um, th just the feel of it. I felt would have worked on Rubber Soul as well. So really, that was kind of a simple uh, help. Uh, Dizzy Miss Lizzie and You Like Me Too Much go backwards to uh, Beatles for Sale and You've Got to Hide Your Love Away and It's Only Love, Move It On to uh, Rubber Soul. Hmm. Interesting how you put you, you Like Me Too Much in there because I didn't, I didn't think that was like going back or backwards. It all. just struck me as a song that they'd already moved away from that type of uh, pop song. Um, and the lyrics that the set, you know, you like me too much. Well, I like you. It mm -hmm. just seemed like they'd moved, they'd advanced on a little bit more as lyricists. So, you know, all, you know, the three of them. So I'm thinking of, you know, like that, that honky tonk piano part, which is kind of different for them at that moment. So 
You Like Me Too Much in the U.S. was on which album again? Beatles 6. Well, there you go. That's why I, I, I maybe that's also subliminally what I'm thinking. Mm. You know what I mean? Backwards to uh, previous. Yeah. Mm. All right. Before I make more mistakes, Alan. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so I originally was going to move It's Only Love backwards to Beatles for sale just because that you know, it's so hard loving you kind of thing. It kind of puts it back in that, you know, album of complaints and and uh, sort of down-spirited love songs. Um, but then I, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> but then I was thinking um, maybe you've got to hide your love away for, for that same reason. Um, and I, I can't, you know, to, to, narrow it down to one of those I, I i'm really not sure um you gotta hide your love away fits the mood of beatles for sale but it kind of doesn't fit the instrumentation of beatles for sale as well as it's only love does um you know it's very acoustic it's got the the wooden flute uh and there's nothing like that really on beatles for sale um, so in terms of the mood of the song, it fits, but otherwise I think it's only love fits a bit better on Beatles for sale, even though we're used to it being on rubber soul <laughs> moving forward, um, for rubber soul. Um, I really think, you know, um, I've just seen a face is really the perfect move, um, forward to Rubber Soul, just because, you know, like we've said a million times in this one episode, we all grew up with that. It, it, it's a great opener. Um, it sort of reinforces that sense of Rubber Soul as an acoustic album, although the British one is less an acoustic album than the American one. Um, so because it was sort of too easy to just move it to where it is on the American album, I thought maybe I should move Yesterday instead. Um, because Yesterday is, you know, we, we always think about Rubber Soul being uh, the, the start of their sort of, you know, really mature writing period. Although I, I, I take Darren's point that there is a lot on help that, that really fits that bill too. Um, but Yesterday, it seemed like it, it uh, you know, it, it again reinforces that acousticness that um, dominates a lot of Rubber Soul. Um, it's sophisticated, uh, although I, I can't think of anything else with any orchestration on Rubber Soul, is there? Don't think so, offhand. No. So, in a way it would stick out, but it sticks out that way on help too, <laughs> for the same reason. I mean, yesterday, it, I don't think it belongs on either of those albums to tell you the truth, but so it would have to be for me, either I've just seen a face or yesterday and um, I've just seen a face I'm only ruling out because of Dave Dexter. <laughs> um, anyway, so. Now we go on to Rubber Soul, back to Ken. Okay, um, Rubber Soul to help. I put what goes on. You know, there's, um, there's something about, I don't know what it is about help, but you know, I, I love the album, don't get me wrong, all of side one, you, they're all songs from the movie. And side two could be a little bit disjointed and I kind of feel like what goes on could fit on there. Also being very much aware that it was really an early John Lennon song, one of his earliest compositions, although Ringo added a line, something like five words to it. Knowing that it's a very early composition made me want to bring it back a peg here to an earlier album. So that's why I chose that one. Rubber Soul to Revolver, for some reason, I didn't have to think too hard about this. I think Drive My Car could have fit really well on, on Revolver. Um, it's got that R&B feel to it. In many ways, something like Got to Get You Into My Life is very R&B to me. Uh, Taxman could be somewhat R&B-ish, I think. 
I think just like uh, Drive My Car was a good opening track on the British album, it, you know, for, for um, Rubber Soul, it could have made a great opening track on Revolver. Although so is Taxman. But just because of the similarities there, I think, um, you know, Drive My Car is not, you know, I don't think of a folk album like the American version was a bit more folky. Um, to start the album, a lot of people who once they heard the British Rubber Soul had a problem with Drive My Car starting starting the album because they're so used to the folk sounds of, of I've Just Seen a Face. But Drive My Car fits a bit better, I think, on, on Revolver for that reason. Okay, Darren? All right, so Rubber Soul, hmm. That's the album we're up to now, aren't we? Well, the tune that I want to take off Rubber Soul that I thought would fit better on Help, um, worked better on Help, is because, well, I mean, you guys already talked about it. Ken, you already talked about what goes on. And, and perhaps in this instance, uh, what goes on was the song I picked because what goes on wasn't on either album in the US. It was on Yesterday and Today. So what goes on, you know, to my to my head wasn't a rubber soul song, wasn't a help song. So uh, I mean that jumped out at me there, and so what goes on goes from rubber soul backwards to help. Now as for moving forward to revolver, now we're getting now it's going to get a little tricky because sonically rubber soul and revolver are for the most part pretty different. Um, maybe if you stripped away a lot of the psychedelia on Revolver, you'll find many more similarities in the songs, possibly. Um, so on Rubber Soul, I picked, uh, let's see, am I reading this correctly? Yes, Think for Yourself uh, was the song I thought that's on Rubber Soul, the UK Rubber Soul, Think for Yourself, would have fit pretty nicely on Revolver. Mm -hmm. So, so that's my rubber soul, those two songs, What Goes On Goes Back to Help, and Think for Yourself goes forward onto Revolver. Okay. Makes sense. Um, we are unanimous on what goes on <laughs> going back to help. Um, I don't know why, um, it just seems to be... Uh, I don't know, you know, maybe maybe what Ken said about side two of help being so diffuse that you could put anything in there, um, sort of, I'm not sure you, you didn't put it that way. <laughs> maybe that's not what you meant. But, um, but I, I, I think maybe that has something to do with why I chose it. But, uh, you know, I think what goes on almost could go on Beatles for sale too, because it has that sort of rockabilly kind of sound. Um, but that one in any case, can go backwards much easier than it can go forwards. Um, and for something to go on to revolver and, you know, and again, keep in mind, it's not necessarily what would be better on revolver or better on revolver than where it is or whatever. It's just that it could fit. Um, and I chose weight. Um, now that I hear Darren's, I think maybe Think for Yourself might be a better choice. Um, but I chose Wait for a similar reason. It has, you know, both Think for Yourself and Wait have a, you know, slightly sort of brash quality that I felt would be more at home on Revolver uh, than most of the other things on Rubber Soul. Um, you know, it's got that sort of bright organ. Um, you know, it's I, I, I'm I'm not sure it would be great on on Revolver. Uh, maybe Think for Yourself actually would be better now that you mention it. So, um, so I chose Wait, but now I'm recanting and going with Darren's choice instead. No one, okay. no one. My choice worked. Drive my car. No, no. Okay. Then. Okay. In fact, I thought it was a pretty awful pick myself. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just kidding, man. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Yeah. 
Who has the time gone? So mm-hmm. Sergeant Pepper. What are you Sergeant doing with Sergeant Pepper, Pepper can? With revolver now. Wait. What did we miss? Revolver. Didn't right? we? Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. See? God, this <laughs> It's I can't confusing. read. I can't read my list either. Yeah, um, and now I'm crossing things out. Now forget about it. Now we're lost driving somewhere <laughs> in the middle of Canada. Mm. Okay. All right, Ken. Ram is next. Uh, uh, <laughs> Oliver to Rubber Soul, because there are some mellow tunes on Rubber Soul. Um, I thought here, there, and everywhere might work. On, on Rubber Soul for that reason. You know, you think about songs like Girl and Michelle and um, In My Life. I mean, Here, There, and Everywhere is right in that same pocket of great love songs, great ballads. And I think that, that could have fit very well on Rubber Soul. Revolver to Sergeant Pepper. Um, I, I, isn't it kind of obvious to think of Tomorrow Never Knows? <laughs> Tomorrow Never Knows was like, it was a sneak peek for what was to come as far as, as I'm concerned. Yes, there's a lot of psychedelic, psychedelic tunes on Revolver with I'm Only Sleeping and She Said, She Said and songs like those. But Tomorrow Never Knows kind of foreshadowed a lot of the more experimentation and psychedelia and more complex recordings of of the Beatles kind of foreshadowing a day in the life in a way. So uh, to me, it's obvious that tomorrow never knows should jump at you to me anyway. Okay. All right. Well, for me, uh, we're pretty much on the same page. You know, I thought it was going to be easier. Uh, I thought, I thought revolver to Sergeant Pepper would be easy and it wasn't. Um, So from revolver swinging back to rubber soul can you pick here there and everywhere and so did i but i thought also similar was for no one Mm -hmm. um so those two i took them both rather than try to dump one of them so those two on revolver i put back on rubber soul and as for revolver tracks moving forward on sergeant pepper well tomorrow never knows um Tomorrow Never Knows was almost too obvious of a pick. I picked it. Um, In fact, Tomorrow Never Knows, actually, as a a song, could have fit even in what they did after Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Um, But Tomorrow Never Knows was the obvious pick, so I said, let me look a little little further. And I, I took Love You Too, George's Love You Too, um, if there was a song, maybe if you wanted to eliminate um, uh, Within You, Without You, that would have been, I really love uh, Love You Too. Uh, and I thought that that might actually make, dare I say, Sergeant Pepper slightly stronger of an album, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I also threw Taxman in there because I felt it was an aggression to Taxman that might have worked alongside of uh, Good Morning, Good Morning. I could hear that. So, uh, and then again, it was a case of not wanting to spend too much time splitting hairs. I just put the three songs down as tracks, uh, moving them onto Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Taxman, Love You Too, Tomorrow Never Knows, and Here, There, and Everywhere, and For No One Going Back to Rubber Soul. It's interesting how you grouped Taxman and Good Morning, Good Morning there, because they both have Paul doing the lead guitar. Yeah, and and there was again an aggression to to tax man, and I was looking for something other than the obvious. Tomorrow never knows, hmm. you know. And when you're going back to Rubber Soul, that was easy. It was almost like get the more more laid back ballad, and here, there, and everywhere fits in with so many of the Rubber Soul type that type vibe. So, but it it, it and from this point on, really, my picks. It went off the charts. I mean, I've got a few holes, as we'll see, because what I thought was going to be easy suddenly became almost impossible for me, at least. So anyway, Alan, moving forward. Okay. Um, 
For Revolver, I had three that could go back to Rubber Soul. And since two of them were already taken, which was here, there, and everywhere, and for no one, um, I, I, I'll go with my other, which I think fits less well, but it was I'm Only Sleeping. Um, I kind of felt in a, in a certain way that it fit the vibe of, you know, Nowhere Man and, um, you know, some of John's introspective stuff. I mean, there there is nothing on Rubber Soul with backwards guitar. So, um, you know, so maybe it's a little bit ahead of the time for that. But um, that was my one choice that hadn't already been mentioned. So, um, but if I really had to pick one, it probably would be here, there, and everywhere. Um, I, I, I think it, uh, it, it fits Rubber Soul uh, a, a lot better, and it is the kind of song that the rest of the Rubber Soul songs are. Um, and it's such a beautiful song that it, it actually would improve any album it was on, you know, which, whichever we had chosen. But the, the deal here is one forward, one back. So, so there we are. Uh, moving towards Pepper, you know, again, obviously Tomorrow Never Knows is, uh, you know, really would fit the best in a lot of ways. Um, and I had as an alternative, she said, she said, um, because to me, she said, she said, and tomorrow never knows are like part one and part two, you know, um, there, there's a similarity there for me, uh, and, and the whole, uh, you know, I know what it's like to be dead. I, you know, all that sort of semi mystical stuff, um, I can see fitting onto aspects of pepper. I mean, some of pepper is actually quite down to earth you know, not so mystical, but nevertheless, I, um, I think it could fit. So those were my two or four. It's interesting how you brought up I'm Only Sleeping before because we go back to yesterday and today, right. <laughs> you know, and it was on there. Mm -hmm. Now, it's only recently that I started to realize as a little kid growing up, I never saw this big difference between rubber sole and and maybe part of the reason why that is, is because right in the middle of all that, I got yesterday and today. Yeah. So, you know, it didn't seem like this radical change when you've already got, I'm only sleeping on yesterday and, today and, um, and your birthday thing and Dr. Mm -hmm. Robert. So mm -hmm. there you go. So now we're doing Sergeant Pepper, right? Right. Okay, Sergeant Pepper to Revolver. I was thinking more songs that production wise were kind of leaner because Sergeant Pepper is known for you know lots of overdubs overlaying a lot of instrumentation so I would go for either like getting better or fixing a hole I think would work on Revolver for that reason um yeah I mean so many of those songs are two and a half to three minute songs that could work on the same songs on Revolver um yeah i mean that's that's what i would tend to think of maybe it's i'm thinking more production than anything else um sergeant pepper to magical mystery tour i don't know there's so many similarities in 1967 in the production of everything and and by the way how do you that's another thing since we know that strawberry fields forever and penny lane was the start of the sergeant pepper sessions anyway but we're just doing the ep are you sure? Well, that, that's, okay. what he, that's what he had in his instructions. <laughs> well, he mentioned Baby or a Rich Man here as a choice for him. Yeah, I think he made a mistake with that. I noticed that too, because mm -hmm. he does say the Magical Mystery Tour EP should be included. Okay. Well, um, so then it's only the songs from the EP. Uh, Sergeant Pepper, what would belong on there? That's... Now I got to rethink this. <laughs> and we will be back after a word from our sponsor. Probably going with something like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Something psychedelic like that. Interesting. Or some, 
something kind of um, layered, maybe within you, without you. I mean, if Blue Jay Way can be on Magical Mystery Tour, I don't see within you, without you, with all of its interesting instrumentation there, though, you know, you got all the Indian instruments. Um, I would say one of one of those two, Lucy in the Sky or Within You, Without You. Okay. Hmm. Darren? All right. So um, the Magical Mystery Tour EP, right? No. Sergeant Pepper. Sergeant Pepper is where we're at. So I've already, uh, what did I add to Sergeant Pepper? Taxman, love you too, tomorrow never knows. All right. Page two, what comes off Pepper? And what gets put on the Magical Mystery Tour EP? To me, Magical Mystery Tour, the U.S. album, and Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band are, I mean, it's, it's so impossible to me to pull the two of them apart. So much that's on Magical Mystery Tour, of course, was recorded during Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band sessions. You know, and it was really no, you know, there wasn't any absolute split. Now we're recording our next album. You know, so there was overlap, even with what we ended up on Yellow Submarine. Right. This is where I started to find where I thought would be easy. Splitting these songs apart and trying to see if they fit somewhere else became very hard. So with Sergeant Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band, I thought, all right. Magical mystery tour, magical, um, thinking about the movie and I'm thinking about the, uh, uh, the big top scene. And I thought being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, this is more thematic, um, a, a circus type of atmosphere uh, would, would qualify it as the song to remove from Sergeant Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band to bump it to magical mystery tour uh the whole fantasy of a mystery tour and there's also a circus involved mm -hmm. uh so being for the benefit of mr kite comes off sergeant pepper's only hearts club band move it ahead to the magical mystery tour ep and taking off sergeant pepper and bumping back to revolver um with a little help from my friends which to, to me is a fairly straightforward song that could have been done at any point in their history. Mm -hmm. um, so I went with that one as something that could go back to Revolver. Um, maybe with a little help from my friends and got to get you into my life. You know, they're fairly straightforward songs that could have appeared really any you know, in many different places um, in their disc discography. So Sergeant Pepper loses being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, which goes ahead to Magical Mystery Tour, the EP, and uh, with a little help from my friends, goes backwards to Revolver. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. I moved Fixing a Hole to Revolver. Um, it just seemed to be one of the few things that I thought would fit, you know, um, its textures are uh, of the kind that you could get on revolver, you know, harpsichord, not that there are really other harpsichords on revolver, but there's so much on revolver that one thing missing is harpsichord. <laughs> so here we go, um, fixing a hole. Uh, and fixing a hole, you know, also thematically, it, it, just as a song, it, it seemed to be the kind of thing that, you know, just just focusing on, it's, it's a little bit trippy, you know, focusing on fixing a hole where the rain gets in, sort of as if you're, you know, just sort of high and noticing this and thinking about fixing it. It, it seemed to fit the revolver spirit um and um moving forward to magical mystery tour uh i pushed getting better that way i'm not totally sure why i was sort of thinking of you know the magical mystery tour film and everything and you know what what kind of song from pepper could have fit a sequence you know in that 
um, strange film and getting better. I don't know. It just seemed uh, at the moment like it might. Uh, now that I think about it, maybe it might not. I don't know. Um, here's another thing. I went from, in my sequences, I went from Magical Mystery Tour to Yellow Submarine and then to the White Album. And I think you guys might have done the opposite and might have gone to the White Album and then to Yellow Submarine. Oh, so. I did the same thing as you. Oh, okay. And Darren? You know, it was, it was, it really, it really uh, started really mixing me up at this point. I know mm -hmm. I connected uh, Yellow Submarine backwards to the White Album, and I'll explain why when we get there. But, um, I mean, really, I was also tempted to just skip Yellow Submarine, being that it was, you know, you got, what, six Beatles songs, Yellow Submarine, take that out of the mix. We've been there already back in Revolver. And, you know, you had, uh, of the of the new songs on Yellow Submarine, they were all kind of out of the Sgt. Pepper camp and... Three of the four. Yeah, so I don't know. Uh, you, you don't want me to go now. It's Ken's turn, right? Oh, yeah, we're going next to yeah, Magical to, Mystery Tour, and, so, and that would be Ken. So you're done with the EP. Did we? No, we didn't do the EP. You're done with Sergeant Pepper, Alan. Right. And now to Ken with Magical Mystery Tour, Ep. <laughs> yep. Um, you know something? When you narrow it down to just the EP, I can hear just about any song from the EP on Sergeant Pepper. Mm -hmm. They all kind of fit. I mean, Sergeant Pepper, the the, in, the song Sergeant Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour are both up tempo McCartney songs. A great introduction to the album itself. Um, any of these songs, I mean, Blue Jay Way could fit so well. I Am the Walrus could fit so well, and you know, you could take Your Mother Should Know and instead of having When I'm 64, replace it with that, the dance hall McCartney. So really and truly, I mean. I could pick any of them. <laughs> they really yeah. do all fit. They all have that 1967 feel to it. Yeah, yeah, that's the problem with these. So then we got Magical Mystery Tour to the White Album. Or Yellow Submarine. Um, no. Yellow Didn't Submarine. Didn't you just say you went from Yellow? Uh, no, I went from the White Album to to Yellow Submarine. Right, okay. Yeah, I was saying I did the opposite. I went from Magical Mystery Tour to Yellow Submarine because the oh, film okay. came out first and anyway. Okay, so I went from Magical Mystery Tour, the EP to the White Album. Okay. So, and that's very tough because you only got those six songs. Um, I'd probably go with something more like what I was saying with McCartney with Your Mother Should Know could have worked on Sgt. Pepper instead of When I'm 64. Mm -hmm. Your Mother Should Know could have worked on the White Album instead of Honey Pie. Um, Fool on the Hill just sounds like a, a song that could have fit very well on the White Album. Another one of those great McCartney piano driven songs, you know, along the lines of Martha My Dear or, or Oh Blah Dee Oh Blah Da. Um, yeah. It's um, because I don't really think of the White Album as having psychedelic <laughs> music. It's stripped down as much as possible. So um, in most cases, so I'd probably pick those two. Okay. Okay. So for Magical Mystery Tour, uh, let's see. Why did I write that over here? All right. So the one to bump back is... You know, I'm, 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 I am actually starting now to get like a little cockeyed with everyone's suggestions. But uh, Ken, you mentioned your mother should know. And your mother should know would be the song that I would put backwards to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Hmm. Um, you know, um, yeah, so really, I mean, there's no more anything different than what you just said. Hmm. Uh, so your mother should know off of Magical Mystery Tour onto Sgt. Pepper. Now, as for matching Magical Mystery Tour to the White Album, I thought, you know, I think of the White Album, I think of Chaos, I think of uh, 
a mixed bag, a hodgepodge, and anything goes. Wild honey pie into um, Mother Nature's son, Helter Skelter into Julia. You know what I'm saying? Anything, every, anything and everything is happening with the White Album. So for Magical Mystery Tour, I thought, it's off the wall. I am the walrus. Uh, could be moved forward onto the White Album, but strip away all the production and psychedelia and all that and just have something like everybody, um, um, everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey. And I am the walrus and Rocky Raccoon and huh? What are these guys, raccoons and walruses? And, you know what I'm saying? So uh, that's what I'm doing with Magical Mystery Tour, the EP. I am the walrus, you know, can fit on the White Album, just stripping away the psychedelia. And your mother should know could go back to Sergeant Pepper. So that's my Magical Mystery Tour tracks. Hmm. Okay. So since I went from Magical Mystery Tour to Yellow Submarine and Yellow Submarine to the White Album, why don't I just do that whole sequence and then we'll sync up again okay. as you guys get to the White Album. And Okay. So for Magical Mystery Tour going backwards, I would move Walrus back to Pepper. Um, it's... It, it's part of that whole 1967 thing, you know. I think of I think of walrus is going really well with, for instance, Strawberry Fields, and Strawberry Fields was the start of the Pepper Sessions. Um, walrus, I think, could have fit in there. I, I don't know where on Sergeant Pepper I would put it, but it seems to fit the sort of you know spirit in a way. Um, and then I was going to move. Your mother should know. To yellow submarine um if you think about it you know you could have a cartoon sequence about your mother should know pretty easily i mean they have when i'm 64 um it it just seemed like it could go into yellow submarine fairly easily so <laughs> excuse me from yellow submarine i would move hey bulldog back to magical mystery tour I can't remember what my reasoning was, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's a, a pretty simple, straightforward song. And, uh, you know, some of the things on Magical Mystery Tour are that way. Some are more complicated. Um, but Hey Bulldog just seems to be more of a backwards looking song than a forward looking song. Um, we know it, it was, you know, from John's point of view, for instance, really just a throwaway Um so, but I put it back with mystery tour because who knows, you know, that, that could have been a, that could have been a bizarre sequence on the bus as well. You know, you could, have, <laughs> I don't even want to go there. Um, and then it's all too much. I would have moved to the white album. Um, I shouldn't say I would have moved it to white. I would have left, left it where it is. Um, but for the sake of this exercise, I'd move that to the white album just because it's, uh, you know, the white album has a bit of everything. Um, but this is something it kind of doesn't have really. You know, it's, it's psychedelic. It's sort of veering into metal a little. Uh, it's... Um, got that feedback in the beginning it's uh you know it, it could have just been another george contribution to the white album i think it 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 would have fit in there somewhere so those are my magical mystery tour in yellow submarine and we catch up with i don't know what what are you gonna do again yellow yellow submarine and white album or white album and White Album to Magical Mystery Tour, White Album to Yellow Submarine. Right. Okay. Interesting, though, what, what you said about um, It's All Too Much, because I that song to me screams 1967. You know, mm. I, I could easily hear that on Magical Mystery Tour, whether you're talking the EP or the, or the album or, or um, Sgt. Pepper. Mm -hmm. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, the White Album to Magical Mystery Tour, I think for some reason my mind th thinks very much about the production 
And, uh, you know, just the fact that what was done in 1967 had a lot more production behind it, a lot more layering behind it. The White Album was stripped down so much more. Um, so I kind of want to have something a little bit off the wall from the White Album with a little production to go behind it with some strings. And so this was not an easy choice here. I went with Glass Onion for that reason. It's, it's a little bit weird um, and how the song ends with the strings and how it slows down the way that it does. It's um, a little bit bizarre in that way. And I think it kind of fits more of what the Beatles were doing in 67. Mm -hmm. um, White Album to Yellow Submarine is, uh, how do you judge? Are you going by the songs that were in the movie? Because then that opens up the doors to a lot of things or just the album itself. And the tough thing about Yellow Submarine, as Darren said, there's four new songs from Yellow Submarine and three of them were, were done before Sgt. Pepper was released. So, um, and Hey Bulldog was done in February of 68. So you would think that would make the most sense because that's closer in time um it, it's almost like an impossible uh thing to pick from um when you've got four songs like that that are just randomly picked although all together now was was written specifically for the film <clears throat> it's just leftover tracks that they put into into the movie and into that album and i don't know this makes absolutely no sense to me now <laughs> when i look at my <laughs> I put Ubla Dio Blada in there, and I'm trying to figure out why. Maybe because All Together Now is such a sing-along song, the same way that Ubla Dio Blada is. <clears throat> I just don't know, you know. Um, I can see it. I could see it fitting into, um, like, the script of Yellow Submarine. Um, it it seems like a kind of song that could have found a place for given what the script is, you know, given the, how the action unfolds, oh, blah, dee, oh, blah, die, life goes on, could, could somehow. Yeah, so you have to be thinking about the film and not just the album <laughs> when you're picking the songs there. Right, yeah. Oh, well. On to you, Darren. No. <laughs> uh, at this point, there is no rhyme or reason anymore. But what I did do, and I agree with you about Glass Onion coming off of the White Album back to Magical Mystery Tour, simply because just the, the concept of a glass onion struck me more as being from a psychedelic mindset. And I mean, and then I started just jotting down random notes, the, the more uh, fringy songs that uh, were on the White Album, you know, Wild Honey Pie. Why? I don't know. That could have gone back to the Magical Mystery Tour. Um, it's hard, I think, maybe try to take these songs and adorn them with what, you know, the Beatles music sounded like just a year earlier. I find that very fast, fascinating the, the, that the band actually take the singles and Magical Mystery Tour out of the equation. All right, that the Beatles went from Sgt. Pepper to the White Album is remarkable to me. And it even makes the artwork on both albums, especially the White Album, make more sense. White Album was the anti Sgt. Pepper. Whether or not they spent extended periods of time thinking that way, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, to try to link all of these songs up at, from this point on, I sort of threw my hands up in the air for a White Album song that could go back to Magical Mystery Tour. What I was able to figure out was that what, would, what could go on the White Album from Yellow Submarine? And I thought that, you know, All Together Now really is a sort of evergreen of a song. That could kind of be in a number of different places. It has, it's, it, it has a, there's a similarity to, similarity to Maxwell Silver Hammer. And, um, all Together Now would work alongside Yellow Submarine on Revolver. So I'm going to take, I'm going to kind of like just go out of order and take uh, All Together Now and Hey Bulldog and put them on the White Album. 
uh, and Alan already uh, sort of alluded to Hey Bulldog already, uh, maybe because they recorded it in that, like that no man's land in between the psychedelics and the more straight ahead uh, white album approach. Uh, hey Bulldog is a 1968 song. It's when it was recorded. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, like um, I Am the Walrus, Hey Bulldog, maybe because there's an animal involved and a little off the wall, Hey Bulldog and Rocky Raccoon and everybody's got something to hide except me and my monkey. Why don't we do it in the road? Those kind of wild songs. So the White Album is going to get all together now and hey bulldog from yellow submarine and i rest my case on the rest of that okay Okay. so now where are we we're at the white album (laughs) okay looking forward and back so i'm doing yellow submarine to the white album and it's kind of like you you already said it's it's an easy choice for hey bulldog hey bulldog would fit very easily on the white album as far as i'm concerned so many great stripped down rockers Lennon songs you know right alongside sexy sadie or everybody's got something to hide uh hey bulldog works very well there even though hey bulldog was recorded much earlier february of 68 i think um and wound up on an, an album a year later on yellow submarine hey bulldog i think would work very well on the white album if you're going Yellow Submarine to Let It Be of those four newer songs, um, Hey Bulldog. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> really? It's the only one that, that could, could go that way. <laughs> you know, that's the one thing. When you talk about the Get Back, Let It Be sessions and what their intent was to have a, to make an album with no overdubbing, the band as it is, to me, the White Album was kind of like that. There was overdubbing, but it was a lot less production. It could be anywhere from one to four members on every single track, but it was much leaner production. Yeah, you got a a few tracks in there like Good Night with an orchestra, a harpsichord on piggies. But the production on the White Album was, you know, more or less kind of bare. It was the band as is. Sometimes could have one member, two, three or four on these tracks, but, you know, there's a similarity there between the White Album and Let It Be in that way. Although there are tracks on the White Album that are more produced. But um, for that reason, Hey Bulldog is an out and out, you know, ballsy rocker, which is just the band the way that that they are. You know, and it, it would fit both of those albums, the White Album and Let It Be. Okay. Yeah. See, it's it's really there's no right, you no longer any rhyme or reason here, and it doesn't help that we've got Yellow Submarine in the middle of uh, the White Album and Abbey Road, and Let It Be was recorded before Abbey Road. So does that related to the White Album? Uh, what I did with the uh, the next at this point now there's no rhyme. Like I said, no rhyme or reason. Thinking in turn, I skipped. I didn't do any more analysis on Yellow Submarine. Uh, I went ahead to Abbey Road and probably because some of uh, Abbey Road's uh, songs in the medley on side two originated from the White Album demos. Um, I looked at Abbey Road and thought of Mean Mr. Mustard, Polythene Pam, um, something a little off the wall. Again, we were talking about the, 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 the variety on the White Album, Magic, uh, Maxwell Silver Hammer. Um, so Mean Mr. Mustard, Polythene Pam, Maxwell Silverhammer, perhaps even she came in through the bathroom window, would be Abbey Road tracks that I would jump back to the White Album. Um, and, uh, and their length would f- fit them in because the White Album has so many of those very short songs. Um, and as for White Album tracks moving forward, the, just... I'm I'm a little confused here. You're going from you're Abbey confused. Road. You're going from Abbey Road to the White Album. I thought I that we skip we'd... Yellow Submarine. Yeah, and, but they and... have to do Let It Be first before the before Abbey Road because it was recorded first. Yeah. <laughs> really? 
we should have sent each other a memo about what order no, we're you know what it is, but there was still, because what would have happened and when we've had these debates about in past themes we all have a little each has a different way of interpreting this that and the other thing and to me let it be yeah i guess should be in yellow submarine's place in between the white album and abbey road but they were there's so much that could, so much interchanging that already had taken place. Mm -hmm. Songs that they were doing during the Get Back sessions that we heard on Abbey Road. Songs they demoed for the White Album that turned up on Abbey Road. Uh, yet our ears for decades heard Let It Be as far away from the White Album, which it wasn't. But it was released far apart. You know, so I kind of didn't, link let it be and the white album together but i immediately jumped the those short songlets that were demoed during the white album that made it onto abbey road i just penciled them in to going back to the white album and i basically stopped there uh because it was just so what so what album? why don't we um since since our endings uh, all have th the final albums in different orders. Why don't we each do the whole rest of our list, um, you know, from the White Album on? Um, and so you should just go ahead and, you know, do it in whatever order you did it. And then um, I'll do mine. And then Ken will do his closing with Let It Be in Abbey Road. That makes yeah, well sense. Like I said, I'm not, the end of my list doesn't make sense because I was sort of getting fouled up with, you know, this was recorded first, but came out after. This was demoed at a different time. And the last few albums sort of all blended into together where I've got like, you know, just random notes of linking things like the long and winding road from Let It Be to something from Abbey Road simply because of ballads. You know what I mean? But then... You could make the argument that, well, you know, something like um, um, I mean, there were ballads on the White Album. You see, then the, the the maturity, and I, maybe it was I was looking at it, the the maturity in the Beatles as songwriters, they had reached a point, I think, uh, and the music was coming not was was being released out of order, as we now know that it you know they all were like one massive album so I, I apologize if i sound like at this point i really drew started drawing a blank but i at that point really kind of lost focus on on how i could move tracks around um so i i don't have much more than that that's how i ended it okay well, so i guess go to ken i go to alan, alan and ken how did you wrap yours your lists my, my main criteria here was to to list the song that I could hear in the previous and the, the, the next album mm -hmm. in my head, what would make the most sense, regardless right. of how it was recorded, when it was recorded. And it does get complicated. There's no doubt about it. Um, because no matter how hard you try, you know, at least in my case, I kept sometimes going back to, all right, I'm not going to pay attention to when this stuff was recorded. Wait a minute, but I had done that earlier with Magical Mystery 2 and, uh, and Sergeant Pepper Sessions. And you begin to lose it. You know, I was losing my mind. But I know what you're saying. When you were talking about the demos, the White Album demos, you take something like Mean Mr. Mustard. You got the yeah. demo of the White Album. The Beatles rehearsed it during Get Back, Let It Be. And then they released it on, on, uh, on Abbey Road. So, you know, how do you look at that song? Do you think of it really as a White Album song first? Or was it, you know? Yeah, it gets it, it can be confusing you know and i gave up essentially at that point hmm. you know because there is so much interchangeable to those albums right so ken how does the rest of your list go let it be to yellow submarine not very easy at all there um i put across the universe in there mm -hmm. and only because i can hear like you know, the universal message of, of across the universe kind of similar to it's all too much in that regard or all you need is love. So I think it works on that level. Um, 
let it be to Abbey Road. I'm glad you said what you did, Darren, because and I could change my mind tomorrow on this, but the long and winding road could work considering all the, the orchestration and what was done on Golden Slumber's Carry That Way at the end. A similar thing with the long and winding road. Um, this feeling of finality here with a song like that. Um, maybe, you know, it, like I said before, I'm thinking a lot about the production end, not, not always uh, compositionally um, what's going on in the songs. And finally, Abbey Road to Let It Be. Um, I could hear I Want You, She's So Heavy and Let It Be. Really? Huh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, it's a great jamming song. You got uh -huh. Billy Preston on there. He was there during the, the Let It Be sessions. And um, it's very complicated because they had different versions that had to be edited together to come up with the final um, version that we know on Abbey Road. But just the fact that if you're thinking about Let It Be as the sessions as, you know, the band jamming a lot. You know, I Want You, She's So Heavy works in that regard. And it was the first song they worked on it after they finished the Get Back, Let It Be session. Right, right. Okay. So that was the rest of yours. That's it. Okay. So mine, because I put Yellow Submarine before the White Album, it works out a little differently. So I would have on the White Album, Savoy Truffle go back to Yellow Submarine. Don't know why. Um, for some reason, as I looked at all the uh, uh, choices, that seemed to work for me. Um, because, you know, again, it's, you know, the imagery in Savoy Truffle and the idea of the sweet tooth and the, and the chocolate selection and all that just seemed like something that it could, that could have been in the Yellow Submarine film, given, a, you know, some other twist in the storyline, you know, it would lend itself to animation, I thought. Um, uh, and then moving forward from the White Album to Let It Be, I was going to move back in the USSR um, just because it's a fairly straightforward rocker in a way um, I associate it with get back. You know, if you think about, you know, maybe I'm thinking that, um, you know, they're both, they both strike me as sort of summary songs in the sense that, back in the USSR has that Beach Boys sound. Um, and I always associate the Beach Boys with summer and then get back, you know, it came out in the spring and it, it just had that sort of feeling of freshness and, you know, sort of a basic steady beat, s simple instrumentation back in the USSR, apart from the jet sound effects is fairly simple instrumentation. It, it just seemed, like if there was something that could be played from the White Album at the Let It Be sessions, um, it seemed to me that back in the USSR was, you know, the most likely, unless you went with one of the solo songs, but um, they wanted to do this as a group. I could see back in the USSR being played on the rooftop um, in pretty much the same way uh, Mike Demacos in his, uh, uh, in explaining this concept, said that uh, everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey, he could see being played on the rooftop. And I could see that too, but I didn't want to steal his choice. <laughs> so, um, so it was back in the USSR. So let it be um, going backwards to the White Album. Um, I moved across the universe back to the White Album. And, you know, it's sort of in the same way as, as Hey Bulldog was recorded in that, you know, February session. Um, across the universe comes from around then too. And uh, it also just seemed like, you know, the White Album being a compendium of basically every kind of pop style there is, you know, again, anything can fit with it. Um, and across the universe, I thought might fit nicely with it. I, although I probably would not use the Spectre version. I would use the original or even better. I'd use one of the ones that came out either on, you know, Let It Be Naked or the anthology. 
those to me are the, the best versions of that song. And then moving forward to Abbey Road from the things on Let It Be. I mean, now that um, Ken mentioned Long and Winding Road, I, I, I definitely see that, you know, with the orchestrations and all that, a, a, apart from that the orchestrations on Abbey Road are better than the orchestration on Long and Winding Road. Um, <laughs> apart from that, and, you know, nothing against Richard Hewson, but, uh, but I moved I Me Mine to Abbey Road. Um, it seemed like uh, it could go more on side one than on side two. Side two is the more complex version, of, uh, the complex side of that album and more orchestrated and edited and, and everything. So I mean, mine being simpler, I think could go on side one with Oh Darlin, you know. Uh, so from Abbey Road moving backwards, um, hard to figure out what on Abbey Road you could put on Let It Be. I mean, you know, I thought maybe Maxwell seeing as it was rehearsed so much and Let It Be, but didn't want to do that. Um, I went with Here Comes the Sun um, just because it, you know, again, apart from the synthesizer part is, you know, simple enough instrumentation that it could have been played on, you know, not on the rooftop probably because it's acoustic, but it could have been played in the basement session um, when, you know, they're filming all those other acoustic songs, acoustic and piano songs. Uh, that could have worked for that. Uh, what do I? Oh, I say, or Octopus's Garden. Uh, I guess I'm thinking Octopus's Garden just because it, it too was rehearsed during Let It Be a little bit, but, or at least Ringo routine did as, as you, as you might say, for, and, and George sort of worked on it with him. Um, and then that's the last album. So we don't have anything to go forward. If, if we had put Let It Be as the last album, seeing as it was the last released, I would say that you could then move one after 909 back to the start of the list and put it on Please Please Me because it's a really old song and it kind of could have fit on there probably. Uh, so that's that. Can I add a couple things? Because Yellow Submarine is what really screwed us up here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the album and the film. Because um, it makes a lot of sense to do songs from the White Album that could have fit on Let It Be and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And definitely mm -hmm. I could hear Everybody's Got Something to Hide being rehearsed by the Beatles during the Get Back Let It Be sessions. And I didn't already mention I could hear them do your blues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, also, if you want to go backwards, what from Let It Be could have worked on, or could have uh, worked on the White Album? Maybe. Um, I've got a feeling. Yeah. Something like that, or one after nine oh nine. Despite it being an early composition. Hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think Mike should send us his list. <laughs> we did all this work. Mike, I want to know what you're thinking. Yeah. You want to know. <laughs> okay. It was it was it was interesting because I would not have thought I would have been able to um, <clears throat> in some instances do the earlier albums easily and then the get totally fouled up with the later stuff, but you know. Um, that's that. It, you know, it's it's interesting. I think, you know, on one hand, we think of every Beatles album as being absolutely distinct and as them getting increasingly more sophisticated as they went on. But I think we all ran into a problem from about Pepper on, um, partly because from Pepper on, you know, they they recorded these things in such an overlapping way. And also as soon as one thing was over, the next thing began. I mean, you think the White Album came out in November. Uh, by January, they're recording a new album that didn't come out, but by, you know, by February, they're starting what will become Abbey Road. And then, you know, a bit more of it in the spring and then the whole summer, basically July and August. Um, was Abbey Road. And those things, I think, in a way, 
change less and it and it it, it becomes as, uh, as as i think darren said one sort of big continuous mishmash of stuff you know that, that becomes hard to move forwards and backwards um so the beginning of the list was a bit easier um because they were they were changing in a way more quickly and yet there were still things that that were sort of left over from the previous period or looked forward to the next period but as they got further on um you know also also you look at something like the white album with such variety um it, you know it's it's it, it's hard to move things around because the variety in, in includes a sense of past and and even in a way future you know if you if you think of um, revolution 9 um that's not something you would find on on basically any pop album with the possible exception of something by zappa you know and and i even i don't think he quite has a revolution number nine in quite that way. But anyway, it was an interesting, um, interesting exercise to try and work through, have to say. Are you saying in a way that the White Album was so all over the place and diverse that anything goes, anything could have fit? Because I, I can't hear say I am the walrus on the White Album. You know, I know <laughs> revolution number nine is as wacky as can be, but I'm also <laughs> that you know the white album was leaner production you know um, in some ways yeah so you know the stuff that's on sergeant pepper i couldn't really hear on the white album and and yet for me with i am the walrus i think um i think i had moved that to the white album not so much because of how it sounded but because of kind of like the um frenzy of the song fits in with some of the other things that are on the white album and i tried to envision the song mixed differently or recorded at a different time without all the psychedelia so you know once it got confusing and everything was twisted together then add in our own individual interpretations of things uh and you know it's complete chaos mm. It all depends upon whether you're thinking about the composition um, or the production behind the song. Those are all factors. Mm -hmm. You know, I could hear I Am the Walrus on the White Album if it was the demo. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. something like that. But once you've got that whole orchestration from, from George Martin and feeding in the, the broadcast of King Lear, you know, to me, that wouldn't have worked on the White Album. Although, look at Revolution Number Nine. What am yeah, I no, Revolution about? Nine. You, you've got yeah. the equivalent of feeding in the broadcasts, and there's orchestration on on the White Album too. And and the orchestration of Glass Onion to me sounds in some ways similar to the orchestration on Walrus. Plus, on Glass Onion, you have a reference to Walrus. So, <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> we could do this for weeks on end. But we won't. I, I know this much. I can't see Please Please Me working on Yellow Submarine. No, probably not. Although I bet they could have made it work if they wanted to do it. <laughs> All righty. So shall we go around and give our contact info and, and say yeah, goodnight? Sure. <laughs> Who's first? Who's first? Ken? Me? Okay. Um, Few things. Uh, the last few weeks have been crazy on my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, because I've done a ton of interviews, and so many of them are very strong and very revealing. Um, I did an interview with a guy named John Harris, and this is uh, courtesy of one of our viewers, Mike Nari, helped me get this interview. John Harris uh, produced and mixed the George Harrison Live in Japan release. And he was there for the entire tour in Japan. And he went back to Friar Park with George, worked on it together with him, got to know George very well. And so he has a lot of stories to tell about George. But um, his, his career has been to record live concerts, not studio at all, all live events. And he's done a ton of work for Paul McCartney, um, going back to the up close appearances. Um, at the Ed Sullivan Theater and the 1993 Fox 
broadcast of, of the tour, that the very end of the tour there, of Paul and his band, all kinds of stuff. Um, the concert for, for Sandy at Madison Square Garden. Um, so many of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame live events were done by John Harris. So we spent almost two hours talking together and that's an incredible interview. Learn a lot, especially about George um, in, that, in that interview. Then speaking of George, I want to um, let you know about this interview with Bernie Hamburger, who is someone who has been part musician and also someone who um, his career has been to repair guitars and to design them. He actually gave George Harrison the green body guitar that was used on the recording of Real Love, the Beatles recording of it, that you can see in the video. He also designed an electric mandolin for George and a nine string guitar for George and uh, has a lot of stories to tell about George Harrison. In that interview, Paul Sally, who wrote the book Little Wing, the Jimmy McCulloch story. I did an interview with him all about Jimmy's life before and with Paul and after Paul. David Wilde, who was uh, a music um, editor for Rolling Stone for many years, wrote uh, a couple of books on the TV show Friends and Seinfeld. And um, he collaborated on Ringo's book, Lifted, the brand new one that just came out with Ringo, as well as the book on 30 Years of the All-Stars. Um, <laughs> just did an interview with Billy J. Kramer right before uh, the taping of this, of this, um, of this show. And Jordan Runtag, who's another music journalist who's written for Rolling Stone and People and Entertainment Weekly and does a lot of podcast shows for um, iHeart Media. Uh, I did a show with him. And um, beyond that, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, the other podcast show that I do. Um, we just did a show for the 30th anniversary of the release of Ringo's Time Takes Time album. And um, then I've got my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, where there's Beatles trivia every single week. Right now, a uh, brand new game on there called Follow Me, named after one of Paul's songs, where you can win books, CDs, DVDs, all Beatles and Beatles related. If you can, please subscribe to Ken Michaels Radio, the YouTube channel, um, and Talk More Talk as well, and visit my website. And you could also email me if you like at everylittlething at att.net. That's as yeah. fast as I can do it. <laughs> all right. Well, um, I'm at WFUV, and if you want to listen to me on WFUV Radio in New York City, I'm on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights, starting at 10, and Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4. We're at 90.7 FM in New York City, in the New York City, the entire New York City metropolitan area, just about. Uh, and you could listen at 90.7 FM. Obviously, I just said that. Or stream us anywhere at WFUV.org. Get our app. Download our app, and you can listen there. Uh, and if you'd like to email me directly, Darren DeVivo or D DeVivo, I think works also at WFUV.org and look for my two Facebook pages. Just do a search, Darren DeVivo, the other one might pop up, whatever the case might be, we'll be in touch uh, that way. That's a good way to, to communicate with me on Facebook. Alan? Okay. You can reach me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can reach all of us by email um, at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter feed, which is at things we said fab. Um, we also have as a group, two Facebook pages, things we said today and things we said today, Beatles radio fans. Um, we always post links to the shows there. Um, we hope you're watching them on YouTube and subscribing to us on YouTube. Um, that would be helpful. You can also get the audio versions on Podbean and um, iTunes. I think Google has now a service that that carries uh, audio version of the podcast. So we're all over the place wherever fine podcasts can be found. Um, also want to thank Mike Demakos for the idea for this show. And um, if you guys want to send us emails or comment on the, on the video uh, with your own lists of what you would put where, um, please feel free. 
and um, I think that uh, that was it was sort of a, a fun to do something different um, for a change. Mm -hmm. So for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.